we're really excited to have Juan Barroso here with us today. Thank you for joining us and being patient through our little troubles there. <laughs> there go. Um, I'd like to start by recognizing that the clay studio stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hawking. It's the traditional homeland of the Lenape Lenape people. And we'd like to take a moment to reflect on the role of the Lenape as the past, present, and future stewards of the land and the role of all of us to join in the tradition of respect and caring for the land and for each other. Um, I will also put into the chat the website of the Lenape Nation for those of you who want to learn more. So. Juan Barroso was born in Oklahoma City and grew up in San Miguel, Tapatapan, Guanajuato, Mexico. He received his BFA in art at the University of Oklahoma and his MFA in ceramics from the University of North Texas in Denton. He received the Ceramics Monthly Emerging Artist Award in May 2020 and since then has appeared in several publications, including 2021 July issue of Studio Potter and the November issue of Ceramics Monthly. His ceramic work is represented by a companion gallery in Humboldt, Tennessee. Barroso is currently living and working in Jackson, Tennessee. I was asking about Texas and you're in Tennessee. That's what we were, that's what you were trying to tell me before. And um, currently has an exhibition up here at the Clay Studio, which we're very excited about. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would love to start with my question, which is how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? So how I got into art um, at first was out of spite and pre-K. There was this girl, they, they did a test on us and we had to draw a car. And my car was just a rectangle with two circles underneath. And hers had the bumpers, uh, the windows, the steering wheel a figure on the inside and I saw her the next day in kindergarten, possibly even first grade, they let her skip forward quite a bit. And I was so mad that I went crying to my mom and she put me in some classes with what I remember being giants, these tall kids. And they, uh, the teacher taught us one point perspective, how to draw castles, um, landscapes. And so I started out pretty early just out of, I guess, jealousy or I, I don't know. But, Whatever motivates you. <laughs> and then once uh, we went back to the U.S. and there was that language barrier having to learn English, art class was the only place where I felt accepted and, and validated uh, to see the other kids smiling and, and kind of approving. And I could tell they liked my, my things uh, without being able to communicate with them so well. Mm. High school, I drew for a girl I liked and was dating, undergrad. Um, the work shift to being about Mexican labor and Mexican culture. And there was a reason for that, which I'll, I'll get to in my presentation. Yeah, that's really powerful that um, it was such an important way for you to communicate and that you felt positive feedback from your peers, which is a big deal. You know, it's not always about the, your teachers. I've heard a lot of people talking about positive feedback from adults and teachers, but both your jealousy and then your, your happy thoughts um, are about kids who are your own age. That's really interesting. And you obviously had a very supportive mother who, yes. who saw you needed something and you know put you on that path. So you feel like her support of you has also been important just to know you could go to college for art. Like not everybody even knows that that's an option, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, her support was pretty important. And, uh, oh, I didn't even tell the story of how I got into art, actually, in college. It was a potato story. Usually, all my uh, my good stories have, have to do with food. I was uh, trying to be an accounting major. And after failing calculus, too, on the way to get a, a big potato to, uh, I guess, comfort myself, uh, the art building was doing portfolio reviews outside on tables for some reason. Mm. And I showed my, my uh, drawings on my phone to one of the painting teachers. And he told me I should apply. And so um, art school wasn't really a decision I made first. But when I made the switch, my, my mom and my parents were like, ah, yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> and so they, they definitely approved and were supportive at that point. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. And it's all because of a potato. 
Yeah. So what other stories do you mentioned this the other day? You have other stories that have potatoes in them. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure there's so much about art. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, so then how did you find clay? That's the next part of the, the story. Okay. That um, was sort of an accident too. I thought the class would be about mosaic painting. So I was still very focused on 2D work. And I thought I'd be able to paint images with little squares, with little tiles. I show up to the um, ceramics building and I see all these pots on the walls, on shelves. And I'm like, oh, wait, this isn't really what I had in mind. But then uh, Stuart Asprey, my undergrad professor, uh, comes in all excited. Uh, he's a really energetic, kind of quirky guy. And I decided to stay just one more day to figure out why he's so excited about this thing. <laughs> And then one day became two, two became a whole week. And as soon as I got on the wheel and my pants got all covered in clay, it reminded me of making fence posts with my dad. Uh, we would make fences together growing up. And so that that parallel with uh, dirty pants and, and clay or mud, I think, uh, made me stick through. Yeah, that's well, that's special. And that's... Um... Um, lovely kind of visceral response that you had to the material, which I think is another story we hear often. People kind of touch clay and they have a memory or something just sparks in them. But you you also didn't give up your 2D work. Um, so I don't know if you want to maybe take this opportunity to, we can share your um, presentation and you can show people images of your work. Okay. Let me, t let me know if you can't share. I don't know. Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Oh, great, perfect. Okay, so in undergrad, uh, I was still trying to figure out what my work was about. And up until the age of 21, it was mostly cats and boats and flowers. Part of the reason for that is that until I turned 21, my parents had been illegal immigrants. We, um, we moved to Mexico when I was four to wait uh, for the paperwork to go through under Reagan. And it just, it just didn't. And so my mom got tired of waiting for my dad to make enough money in the U.S., and we decided to move back. And so it ended up being what, 12, 13 years of living with fear, just trying to blend in, not get into trouble, not attract attention to my parents who couldn't speak English, learning English fast enough to uh, translate for them. And so whenever they finally got their uh, residency, um, I think I was barely turning 22 around the time. It was, uh, it was a freedom and being able to express my identity and my culture, the values I grew up with. And there was a shift in the work. And it went from flowers to more Catholic imagery and then labor, as well as the musicians. The cats kind of stuck around for a little bit while I transitioned the work. You can see that in this mariachi mountain lion uh, plate. But I think the most significant thing was my parents becoming legal residents and being able to talk about all these things. Mm. And then in grad school, by then I had gone back to Mexico finally after so many years because my parents could come back without fear of getting past the border. Mm. And I ended up painting quite a few of the images of images that I took back in Mexico. These are oral paintings of an Aztec dancer and a street musician who memorized so many songs you could name a song and they would know it. I uh, consider them like a Mexican Spotify of sorts. The, their intelligence to memorize all these songs and play them. And if they didn't know one, they'd give you 10 other options of a similar theme. These are graphite drawings of my cousin on the left and his dad's bike shop. And an apple salesman on the right. 
Then I started to think about our time back in Mexico when my mom would uh, sew clothes, repair clothes, wash clothes to provide a decent meal for my sister and I. There were days when we didn't have uh, food and just when we think that we weren't going to eat that day, a family member would stop by and ask for a, a repair on their shirts or their pants or a dress. And um, yeah, I ended up using thousands of little dots that I paint with a small watercolor brush to honor the thousands of stitches that my mom uh, probably went through to um, help us out. The vase was coil built, and I think it's my most detailed piece up to this point. Yeah. This is a coil built mop bucket. The wheels turn and rotate. So there's the mechanism to make to squeeze the mop. Um, it's a functional mop bucket, even though it would squeak and grind really bad, but I wanted it to work. It's coil built and slab built on some parts. I haven't used it yet, but um, it was sort of an apology to my mom. I went through high school embarrassed of the neon pink sign that she had in the back of her car that said Lucy's House Cleaning Services. She would babysit and clean houses to um, make sure that my sister and I wouldn't have to work to get through school. And I would make her drop us away from the school because <laughs> I was embarrassed of that sign. And it wasn't until I worked at Michael's for you know the next six years after that, I was mopping uh, the night shift, cleaning the restrooms, and I realized there was dignity behind the work that she had been doing. I, I finally, um, I was grateful. And I, I, I wish I hadn't been so embarrassed about that sign. So this was a way to apologize to my mom. Yeah. This installation uh, was 263 or 64 water jugs made of porcelain, a slip cast from 12 molds with a painted skull on the top. It was about the year 1999 when my dad crossed the border to the US when I was back in Mexico, or he attempted to actually. Um, 263 people died that year on the US side. Mexico side is a lot worse, but they don't count. And all I remember is my dad's bloody feet on the bed of his walk back. He had received a ride from some men in the desert who had gasoline containers in the back of their truck. The heat of the sun made the containers light up, and they believed that it was my dad and the other men riding in the back that had lit them on purpose. So everybody's jumping out of the back of the truck. These guys get mad. They're shooting at them, and they have to escape and make their way back home through the desert. Took took a while for them to find their way back. Um... So it was a way to maybe process the, the details of that story that he told me, because like I said, all, all I remembered was the bloody feet, not really understanding what he had tried to do uh, to provide for us. Uh, the razor wire water jugs, they're also to talk about the border experiences of immigrants. Uh, my mom showed me a picture of a woman and her daughter all cut up and their attempt to cross this wall. Um, they made it through, but the cost was a mess, a pretty big mess. And so this is my reaction to the bloody pictures of uh, that what they paid. After grad school, I went to Companion Gallery as a long-term resident. And there I tried to focus on making decal, um, a decal series. And for that, I made graphite drawings that I then photographed and put into iron decals. And most of my time at Companion Gallery has been a focus on more color. And in this one, it's in the, the gray background, which is actually gonna be a green if I added more of a stain. But I like it as a great background because it lets me use the white underglaze and the black underglaze together, similar to my um, charcoal drawings. This is my most recent decal drawing of uh, some strawberry pickers. I went to a local farm 
uh, close to Humboldt, Tennessee. I heard their stories, how much they missed their family, how much their knees were hurting, how much their backs were hurting, how hot the heat of the sun was. And they all seemed hopeful and they were all just trying to provide for their families back in Mexico. So it was, um, it was a very cathartic experience to hear their stories and photograph these men and then to draw them as well. And the mugs on the left are the results of that drawing. And as you can see, it's quite a bit more color. And that's sort of where I've been uh, focusing most of my time recently. I also introduced color into the image itself a little bit. And the new form references the morcajete. It's a Mexican mortar and pestle for making salsa. Also, the indigenous people of Mexico um, had tripod vessels. And it also references uh, the Purepecha people. Um, my aunts are 80% indigenous. And I think I might be closer to 40 or 50%. And I think my grandparents can trace us back to some kind of um, archers of sort, either Purepecha or... Um, what was it Chichimeca? Yeah. I'm also sure about that, but we lost track of, of quite a bit. And that's common for a lot of families where and it was San Miguel Octopan. Thank you. That was really I mean it's your work is so powerful and we're so lucky to have it. Um in the gallery. Actually, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I can, I'll show the images that are downstairs at the clay studio right now. And it's been a real pleasure to be able to see them um, in person. Just share my screen for everyone. Oops. So, um, you were talking about, in terms of process, the um, the idea of making the decals so that you can share more of these with people because obviously when you're putting them, the drawing directly onto the surface, they're, they're only one is available. Um, so I think it's this one, right? That's um, drawn directly onto the surface. Oh, the penguin, um, that's what it has a story too. Two years ago, I um, the the woman I was dating passed away suddenly from a blood clot uh, in her lungs and it went to her brain. Um, it was some weird genetic thing in her family that's been affecting the, the, the women of the family. Her sister died recently as well. And she loved penguins. They were all over her, her walls and her, her Christmas cards and the, the idea of the penguin finding this, uh, is, I think it's a touristy story about the penguin finding a stone to give to its uh, potential partner. And they present this stone almost like an engagement uh, ring of some sort. And uh, she used to love that story. And the, the, this idea that, that uh, clay is essentially eroded rock made me kind of find a parallel with the penguin and potters a little bit. So it felt like we were both penguins uh, and I wanted to build a home with her. And um, after she passed away, I changed my signature to two little penguins with my initials J and B in the center. And so the penguin imagery has uh, come back quite a bit as a way to process and remember and honor her. And uh, about every piece has that signature of the penguins on the bottom as well. It feels like the processing of your work in general is often the processing of it, meaning the making, the process of it is processing your emotions and your grief and your feelings, you know, what you said about apologizing to your mother. And um, can you talk a little bit about the, how, how did you come to the, that process of this very, you know, pointillist drawing technique? So to answer the question about pointillism first, I would say the first piece was a red rose 
for a girl I, I really, really liked uh, in high school. I had a red pen. I wanted to show her how much I cared, I guess, and I had this crazy idea of making a rose out of a million dots. That's where this thing started. And I got to 680 something thousand dots by the time I was done. I didn't hit a million. And I was thinking about coming back in and adding black dots to bring the contrast up even more. Um, but then we broke up. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Again, I'm more impressed that you counted the dots than, than that you made them. <laughs> yeah, I was counting all of them. Um, and then, then there was a ceramics class. I was trying to find a way to add images. And so it started out first as washes. But then the, the highlights and mintones would fade away with a clear glaze. Mm. Eventually, I noticed that the pointillism, if anything, darkened after the dots shrank and got closer together. And that was the, the, the contrast and the, the values I was searching for. I did. Uh, the other part of that question about processing emotions, the, the process is a way to show my devotion and love for my people, my family members a way to um, vent or process. Yeah, heartbreak. It's a, it's a very emotional thing. And I, I'm not sure if, yeah, I'm not sure what I would do if I didn't have um, all these mediums, colored pencils, soft pastel, clay, underglaze, uh, acrylic paints, old paints. It's all, yeah, it's all, it's all been a way to cope, really. A way to, if I'm being honest, even a way to, um, how do I say this? Having to hide my our identity and, and our roots because of fear of deportation, it felt like this is a way to justify our existence in the U.S. of sorts. That there was a reason we we are here. Um, something like that. But because there's such value in this like very beautiful art that you're making. Is that, is that what you mean to justify it through making of these beautiful objects? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, one of the times I went back, I saw my old friends from back then. They, uh, they were playing basketball on the courts and one was telling me like, oh, I don't sniff that glue stuff anymore. And he was reeking of this brown glue that I remembered. I could still smell it and remember. And he, you know, a couple of minutes later, I see him sitting down with his brown bag and he's sniffing this glue. And as, as much as I like to think that I would have had better morals or maybe like been a better leader for them or something, I saw what my life could have been if I had stayed behind. I could have been in that basketball court addicted to some really cheap brown glue uh, without much hope. And um, yeah, it's strange. Uh, instead, I'm I'm here making work out of clay, painting, talking to people in English. <laughs> I never could have imagined this, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's a good answer or not, but that's... yeah, no, absolutely. That's I mean, that's so. It's it's hard to um, just come up with another question because everything you're saying is so meaningful and powerful. But I'm just going to keep moving forward. Um, I was thinking a lot about the skulls and the use of black and white in your work has so much kind of metaphorical light and dark to go around along with the very um, literal light and dark and life and death. And even the, the image that you showed of the school of thread it shows that you're, you're drawing with light and dark because the the highlights of the white highlights of the thread against the shadowy black parts are, it's almost like magic, you know, you're just putting light black and white together and you get this beautiful, realistic, three-dimensional drawing that's kind of jumping off the, the surface at you. Um, so then it's interesting that you were, you were saying like, you're trying to put more color into your work. So I guess I'd love to hear what you think about you know, this, it's very, this dedication to kind of black and white, and then why, like, what is the motivation to put the color, and how do you see those two things working together? Is that too, 
too um, abstract of a question. Uh, I just need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll just follow up really quickly with the, um, the image of the strawberry grow strawberry picker's hands. That's very, you know, it's all black and white. And then the red strawberry, that is um, an incredible use of both of both of these ideas that you're working with. So yeah, maybe talk a little bit more about that. Okay. <clears throat> So the use of black and white. Um, so a, a lot of the pieces uh, have a pretty, pretty big emotional toll, especially the political ones. Um, to balance that out, I paint my birds, the, the ones that aren't political, the ones that are happier or just just beautiful, hopefully. And so this idea of, of balance just to cope or survive, I think, is there. And I think it's in the colors as well, just searching for this use of both. And this dance between light and dark, I think, is also parallel with uh, by being a bilingual and bicultural individual. Having to dance between two different worlds all the time, I think, uh, can be a beautiful thing. And it can also be a heartbreaking thing. Uh, some people feel like they're stuck in the middle. Um, sometimes I feel like I get the best of both worlds. And so I think that might be my best answer for that. The introduction for color. That happened after COVID. I noticed a lot more artists were using color in their work and maybe some attempt to be happier to, I don't know, be, be more joyful in their day. And um, including Stuart Asprey, my undergrad professor, he started using blues and reds in his backgrounds, I think, and it's still using uh, quite a bit of color. And so, yeah, I think it's been a way to just add the happier surfaces. And recently, I'm hoping to find the, the yellows to greens of corn. Yeah, that's, those are great answers. And, um looking for color for joy is definitely something I, I think that that's a, a trend that's happening now, just like you said, because of COVID. Um, so we have in the gallery right now, a piece by Jonathan Christensen Caballero um, that is so much in line with the work that you do in terms of honoring the labor of um, Latin American people. I don't know if you've seen a picture of it or if you just know his work in general. Perhaps. I know his work. Yeah. So. I feel that that he uses those pops of color in, um, I think it's a similar way. Like it's a very serious topic. It's figures of representing laborers, but then there'll be some like downstairs, it's bright blue and yellow and, um, and red. And your first emotional like response before you realize what's happening is, is happiness. And it's a way to um, mitigate the difficult subject matter, which I think is important. Um, to just be able to have the audience really engage with it. Because I think if it's too heavy all the time, then people, you sort of have to attract them, right? With the, the bright colors. Another thing I think about, especially with the work that's downstairs is that you're using them. <clears throat> You've added mason stain, I think, to the to your porcelain. And it gives a, a real, a look of, um, reminds me of Wedgwood Jasper ware. So um, historical, British ceramics that are infused with colors like that. And it's that um, unglazed porcelain surface with the color in it that has that reference. And then the way you do your drawings, the pointillism is so connected to um, like dry point and etching techniques that people use on, on metal plates actually, and then use that to make decals. So I wonder if you've experimented at all with etching or, um, you know, do you have, do you feel any connection with those historical ceramics? Like, have you studied them in museums and classes, or maybe it's just come up because it's um, parallel to those things? So I do love printmaking. I took a class in undergrad. I like um, dry point. I like lithography. Um, wood, wood block prints, mm -hmm. although I haven't done very many. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the historical references, I like the pots from, from Puebla pottery, 
as well as Mata Ortiz pottery from Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the stuff from Mata Ortiz is more line, but um, I think the attention to detail and, and the patience is, is there. And part of it too is that my hand is a little shaky. You can't really tell from the dots, but I can't do line very well. <laughs> and so I really admire the, the, the bases and the form from Mata Ortiz uh, pottery. And I think I lost track of the question, actually. Oh, you answered them. That's fine. Oh, okay. Um, how about, do you have a project that's coming up that you want to talk about or a new idea for a new direction? So the thing that's coming up is a show at Alfred Curie by Jonathan, mm -hmm. which I mentioned. And um, I am in the process of packaging up uh, that drawing of the strawberry pickers. Uh, a pitcher with some strawberry uh, picker, or oh, actually orange picker uh, hand, mm -hmm. and um, a hard hat uh, slip cast piece. And yeah, I, I think that's the, the most pressing thing at the moment. And then I just got to make work for Ensika. I'm going to have some work for that. As far in the, uh, as the studio goes, I do want to find those yellows to greens of corn. Mm -hmm. And I already have my test styles. And so I'm I'm close. I'm pretty That's close to, to changing to, to more greens uh, recently. And I'm also trying to push the black and the white underglaze on gray a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I have a picture form only in a sketch so far of, um, it's, it references a penguin. It's going to be like a, a penguin picture, really yeah. abstracted, but mm -hmm. I'll have a new form soon as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, Jonathan was telling me he's going to be in Alfred in maybe in like a month or something. I guess that's for the opening of the show. I think so. What and are you in an exhibition at Antica? <clears throat> uh, yes, but I I forgot with who. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <right. laughs> I'm just I'm just worried about making the work right now. Yeah, that's the most important part. Yeah. What kind of studio space are you in? Like a group studio, or do you have your own space? It's a shared space. I have maybe um, well, like, um, six by 10, something like that. It's not big, but it's enough. Back home, I was working off of a coffee table. It was my, uh, and the wheel next to it. I'd move the wheel over to the living room, get stains all over the couch, which is why now they replaced the sofa. Um, <laughs> But I'd be throwing and I'd be painting on the coffee table. I'd be photographing on the coffee table. Mm. It, yeah, I was making a mess back home. Uh, so to go from, um, what, three by four table to slightly bigger, it, it was still a big improvement. Yeah. Is there a good community of ceramics or craft people where you are in Tennessee? Do you feel <clears throat> yeah. a good spot? Yeah, I've learned quite a bit from Eric Bobbill, the owner of uh, Companion Gallery. And my friend Horacio from grad school is right next to me. He's a few feet away uh, mm -hmm. when I'm working in the studio. There's Andrew Clark there as well. And the community there has been really friendly, really helpful. Um, we have like unofficial critiques sometimes. And it just, there's been a lot of growth, especially in color, just to be around these guys. Yeah, that's great. Ceramic artists need to be in, in community, I think. Yeah. Um, I think there's some things in the chat, so I'm gonna check that. And I just was wondering if anyone has any questions. Diana says, gorgeous drawings. And, Thank you. Um, outstanding, meaningful work. Diana is all about the chat right now. Thank you, Diana. Does anyone have any questions um, that they'd like to ask one maybe about process or anything else? I have a whole presentation on process. You do? <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to see that. OK. If you want, do you have it right there? Yeah, I can pull it Great. up. Let's do it. Wow. 
So um, whenever I'm doing a workshop, I teach two different methods to start an outline. Uh, mm -hmm. First is by citing and just freehanding it. And the other is with tracing paper. If you have a flat surface you're painting on. Let's see. So early on um, in grad school, they had us teaching uh, beginning drawing classes where we taught the students how to cite proportions and use the head of a person, or in this case, the head of a mountain lion to measure how many heads it takes to get to the end of the tail or for a figure to get to the feet. And so you can use one measurement as your unit of measure to see how many of those it takes to get to the edge of something. So just comparing parts to find the whole. And this is an example of some student work, how they would use maybe the height of the front edge of a box to figure out how many of those it takes to get to the left edge or the right edge or something. It's a lot of tedious just measuring. On people, you can use the distances between the eyes, the distances between the chin to the nose, the bottom of lip to the nose. On cats and animals, I like to use the nose height to measure out the rest of the face. Especially for dogs too. I have an example of how I did that on this face where I started out with the nose. It was really off at first, but then I noticed that, um, I guess the, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Okay. That one nose height and a half got me to the bottom of the snout. I noticed that one nose, one nose height equals one nose width. That was, I got lucky there. Usually it's a little off, but I use that measurement. Um, one snout height was the same as this height to the very to the right of the eye, and I made that match on my vase too. I measure how many nose widths it took to get to the edge of the head, and it seemed like it was two nose widths, and then the eye would start. So I found the placement of the eye. It was three and a half nose widths to the right to get to the edge of the head. I sighted the angle of the head, how far the right ear had to go, also comparing it to the nose. And so it's just a lot of comparing the parts. And by the end, you've used a huge grid of just measurements, all coming back to a nose height or width. And this was a curved surface. And so these measurements helped in making it look right from one angle where a tracing paper would have wrapped and maybe shrunk the head a little weird. And then- yeah, I, was just, um, I was just gonna say, you put it on a curved surface. So that was way more complicated than if you'd just been doing that onto a piece of paper. Yeah, if it's curved, I, I gotta freehand it. If it's flat, that's where the, the easy, easy part comes in. Um, I use the needed eraser to erase the part I'm working on next. The uh, graphite can get in the way. It can act as a resist of sorts mm -hmm. if you have too much of it. So I erase the part I'm working on next. The thickness of the underglaze, it needs to want to spill over. If it's so thick, it doesn't want to move. When you try and tilt it, then it's just too thick. So I add water until I'm scared that it's going to drip off if I tilt the cup. So like barely thin enough to wanna level itself out. Where I grab the underglaze from for highlights, I just kind of get the, I mostly try and clean the brush tip with water and then it gives me the highlights to close to mid-tones. Uh, mid-tones I grab from the middle where it's um, still a lot of water. And for the darks, I just grab the underglaze. Uh, directly from where the clump of it is. I try and mark the direction of the fur or feathers with a few brush strokes just so I don't lose track. And as the photo is not clear enough to see the hair direction, I try and find a different photo because it, it looks weird as the fur isn't going in the right direction, mm. especially if you know where, where it needs to be. For Oh, for, for different textures, like here on the tongue, I end up using like mostly water to just push the underglaze over a little bit. 
And sometimes I do maybe like brush strokes to make lines. And then with water, I fade it out to make it look a little bit hazy. Just so it looks like a different texture than the fur on the rest of the dog. Here's an example of that. First, it's like a feather or fur texture. And then I go back in with water and just to make it hazy. I'm going to skip to uh, the tracing paper transfer. OK. Hey. So uh, with a mechanical pencil, I'll trace the outline uh, from my phone or a drawing pad if you freehanded your image first. And then after we've done that, we flip the tracing paper over and trace the outline on the back with a charcoal if your piece has texture or a 2B lead if the clay surface is smooth. I sand my uh, pieces to make them smooth. And so I use a 2B lead on a mechanical pencil. The 2B lead is softer and darker and so it will show through when you transfer it over. This is me tracing the outlines of a bird. I flip it over and I trace over the outline with a 2B lead. I use a 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil. It keeps the line pretty clean to use a 0 0.5. 0 0.9 is a little too thick. 0.3 is too thin, it won't transfer. I place it where I want to transfer the outline to. In this case, I'm using a flask. I hold the tracing paper with one hand and then I just rub with a mechanical pencil and it pushes the graphite over to the clay surface. After you've um, transferred the outline to the surface, it'll be very light. So you'll have to go over it with a mechanical pencil just so it doesn't smudge away. So after you go over it, then you erase the part you want to work on next. So, uh, for that part, I just mentioned, I guess, uh, let's see. How you can use an EAD eraser to soften the edges a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I use it to erase the part I'm working on next because the, the graphite can act as a resist and it doesn't let you see those edges so well. Does the kneaded eraser take the underglaze away or does it? Does uh, it slightly, which I, I have used before if it got too dark. Um, but no, mostly it takes just the graphite. Oh, those are some videos. So I start in the dark areas first. Because I, I, sometimes I, it's hard to tell if it'll be a dark uh, tone or not. So if it's dark and you're in the dark area, you can just keep going. But if it's a mid-tone, you move the brush over to the mid-tone area. That way, you don't put a dark spot in your highlights. So I always start in the dark areas. And depending on what tone I'm getting from the brush, I shift over to the correct spot. And usually, as you're using the underglaze, the tone starts to soften. So if I'm wanting a slight gradient, I start where I want it to be slightly darker. And as I'm using up the underglaze on the brush, it starts to lighten on me. And you can use that on purpose to move towards the highlight. At the very end, I start to com come back in with the darker underglaze to push the contrast a little bit more. Yeah. Most of it at first is just mid-tones to highlights.
I think this video shows, yeah, how I go back in and just darken, yeah. darken quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's in shadows. So are you, teaching, are you teaching classes now? Only one-time classes for beginning students. Mm -hmm. Not really painting classes. Uh, for mistakes or highlights, I use the needle tool. So I paint the dark, uh, dark background first and I just scratch away the highlights. I have used an earring before or um, the exacto blade works just fine too. Oh, we have a question. Is that bisque clay? Oh, yes. Yeah. I paint on bisque. I used to paint on greenware. Um, but back then, the risk of, of losses was a bit higher. Mm. So I had this painting and the piece would crack and then it would hurt quite a bit. And yeah, so a million, a million dots, a lot of, that's a lot of dots to lose. Yeah, I learned really quickly to just, just paint on bisqueware. Um, um, but... we another... Oops, sorry, we have one more question. How long does a drawing usually take? <laughs> it depends on the size. How much, how long did the bird take? Yeah. Oh, that, that bird, um, three hours or so. Three but hours. My birds, my birds usually take uh, seven to eight. Seven. That one was just for the demo. Just a oh, word, just small. That's a and, lot of hours. Yeah. Uh, some of the other pet portraits can take uh, 10 to 12. The uh, portraits with pointillism, that's more like 24. Mm. The... That's why it's good that you started doing the decals. Yes. <laughs> Have you done the decals on raw clay with no glaze? No. No, no I haven't tried that. Yeah, don't you need the glaze to take the? So, uh, I'm not doing the on like a really high polished Oh. Then... Did you hear that one? Someone tried it with super highly polished porcelain without the glaze, and that sometimes that works. Hmm. I should try that. Yeah. Um, I've only tried luster over, yeah, really polished piece with uh, Ian Childers. We did a collaboration, mm. and uh, the gold luster is, is stuck to the piece even if it wasn't glazed. Mm. So it makes sense that a decal might as well. I just haven't tried it. Yeah, I just don't like forget the edges. I was just gonna say there's you might see the edges unless you you know you have to cut the decal super mm. close or design it so that you could hide the edges. Yeah, it could be cool. Thank you. Yeah. How did how do you determine which slip pads more than the How do you determine which slip cast form goes with which image? Uh that's a good question. <laughs> so sometimes it's pretty obvious, like the mop bucket, where I painted the janitor, and, and it fit the theme of the the piece. Mm -hmm. For the water jugs, the the razor wire, the case children from the board, mm -hmm. it also made sense. Um, for mugs, it, it's been all over the place. Mugs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the form hadn't really been tied to Mexican culture until the most recent form with the tripod feet. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. It doesn't always fit the form, but that's something I need to work on. I think they're all great. I don't, I don't think any of them don't fit, that's for sure. Um, yeah, was there, did you want to say one, a, a little bit more about this or? I'll show you the brushes. I use uh, the 40 Windsor Newton Gottman brush. Mm -hmm. It lasts longer. Uh, the watercolor brushes make more dots per brush load. It's a higher quality brush tip and it doesn't uh, curve as easily. After so many dots, uh, the brush tends to curve a little bit. I've tried other brands and when I load the brush, it gives me three to four dots. For some reason, this specific brush gives me up to 20 dots, which is great. When it comes to repetitive movements, I need to try and save my wrists as much as possible. My fingers uh, start to hurt a little bit more recently. And now 
uh, I switched the brush after painting about four square inches of imagery uh, because it, it, this one still manages to wear away a bit too quickly. Um, because that's just the nature of the work I'm doing. And it might not be noticeable but once you take a close up photo, you can see how it starts to curve a little bit. And then my dots go from dots to differently sized crescent dots, mm. more like ovals. So in this piece, you go from clean dots on the eye to where the dots start to vary a little bit too much from my taste. From far away, no one would notice. But I think uh, the reason mine, my images are so clean is that I switch them out the moment I notice any decrease in quality. And is it that's the end of that brush, or you just need to like wash it and let it dry again, or something? No, that's that. That's it. It becomes okay. um, it becomes like a watercolor fur texture brush for a little bit longer. Mm. You need to get that company to sponsor you so they can give you more brushes. That's, that'd be nice. I buy in bulks of a hundred or two hundred of them, and wow. just kind of use them. And I I need to figure out where I can donate them afterwards. I'm sure that they're still useful for other people. Um, yeah, they're just we a very short lifespan for me I guess. We have a place called the Artist Resource Exchange where people bring um, art supplies that they don't need anymore and then it's like a thrift store so I don't know if there's something like that around you. I need to look into it. I, uh, I throw away too many of them. Well this has been wonderful. I'm really I'm so glad we ended up with the process at the end because it's what a, a treat to get to watch you doing the work and seeing how you um, transfer the, the, you know, a photo to a rounded surface. It's really special. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any last questions from the room or from the chat? We also had another person who said, very moving, profundo gracias de Rafi y familia. So it's one other little comment in the chat. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. I guess my only comment is I just love that you know how many dots that you can, it's like you have this really scientific, like, I, I just find it incredible that you know how many dots you can scatter each paintbrush. Yeah, did you hear that or should I repeat it? I didn't hear the last part, but I got the gist of it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah well, just that you know exactly how many dots you can get out of each brush, too. Is really, oh, yes. Really scientific and great. And that is, there's just the range from the literal nature of your images to the emotional depth of them and then the very scientific way that you're making them and then the beauty that comes from the, these counted dots they turn into something beautiful so thank you so much again we're so happy to have your work in the <clears throat> in the shop downstairs and we hope you'll come visit sometime and good luck with your next projects Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. See ya. Bye.